very much for coming to today's webinar. Uh, it's not common that we would have a broad presentation of companies and talent uh, from one country. This is an unusual exercise for ADB, but uh, judging by the quality of talent that we've seen so far, I think this is going to be a content rich presentation. Uh, so on that note, I would very much like to present, uh, pass the meeting over to uh, AED Ernesto Brahm from the Dutch constituency at the ADB board. So AED, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. Goedemorgen, beste landgenoten. Good morning uh, to everyone who's present in this uh, Brahm bag. I'm very happy to speak a few words here today at this uh, orange clockwork on waste management waste to energy, circular economy and marine plastic. Now, Brownback itself, as we know by its material, is environmentally friendly. Unfortunately, today we don't have any lunch inside the Brownback. But anyway, I joined the Asian Development Bank uh, last September, uh, representing the Netherlands, but also six other countries, Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, uh, Finland, uh, Ireland and Canada. I would like to thank uh, Steve Peters, um, as well as Priyanta Wijayatunga for, from the ADB site for organizing this brown bag. And I would also like to thank Jules van Son and Hans Breukelman, and of course, many others who are involved in the organization today. Um, a cleaner environment, sustainable development, and climate goals, reaching the climate goals require cooperation and exchange of knowledge between experts entrepreneurs, research institutes, governments, and international organizations, including multilateral development banks such as the ADB. Now, today we uh, will see a discussion between a wide spectrum of experts, research institutes, entrepreneurs from the Netherlands, active in waste technology, and experts from the Asian Development Bank. Now, this brown bag will hopefully be the start of a dialogue on innovations and solutions regarding the circular economy, uh, waste management, waste to energy and marine plastics. Now to note a, a interesting um, uh, fact is the Netherlands is currently the sixth on the ranking of the Global Innovation Index. And on the Eco Innovation Scoreboard of the European Union, the Netherlands is among one of the top performers. Worldwide, the Netherlands is leading on waste management and the circular economy. There's uh, high recycling in numbers in the Netherlands, which is probably due also to the intensity of the uh, population and also the willingness, which uh, is very important, to cooperate in multi-year coalitions. In the Netherlands, most households separate waste in five different categories. It depends on the city where you live, of course, and chemicals separately. Now, this brown bag can be the start of a dialogue on innovations and solutions in waste management. And I would like to invite the participants, uh, particularly also from the ADB side, to ask questions to the experts and institutes from the Netherlands who are present here today. And also, I would welcome ideas for a concrete follow up of this meeting so that it, that it's not going to be a one off. This brown bag is timely because last October in the board of directors, we adopted a new energy policy to assist the developing member countries of the Asian Development Bank with energy access and low carbon transition. We adopted this policy just before COP26 started. Now I would like to end with a quote, which is as follows. Uh, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So we need innovation. And all of you, of course, know that this is a quote by Albert Einstein. He was his time well ahead. Now I wish you a very fruitful and productive um, um, brown bag uh, session today. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, AED. You're very kind. Uh, the work that uh, the Netherlands has done was especially important to convincing people to accept the new energy policy because of some of the pioneering work that's been done in that. So now it's my great pleasure to hand over to Jules van Sant from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Jules, the floor is yours, sir. Yes, thank you, Steve. 
Um, I'm just going to share my screen for a few slides. So uh, I'm a PSLO for the ADB, working at the uh, Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Uh, I'm shortly going to explain the role of the Netherlands Enterprise uh, Agency, also RVO in Dutch. Um, it's part of the Dutch government, uh, and it's an agency that uh, connects government and the Dutch private sector. Um, it is uh, appointed to contribute to societal uh, challenges in the field of sustainability, uh, agriculture, innovation and international business. Um, the organization has a wide national and international network, uh, either both uh, public and private uh, in a broad range of sectors. Um, and as a government agency, it uh, executes a wide range of programs of Dutch ministries, <clears throat> from, ranging from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Economic Affairs, and so on. So in total, around 4,000 people work there. Um, the RVO Team International Organizations is where uh, I work together with my colleague Leila Vandic, who is also in a liaison for the ADB. Uh, uh, the, our team is commissioned by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, and it functions as a liaison between the Dutch private sector and multilateral development banks and international organizations. So besides ADB, we also do that for the World Bank or EBRD uh, or organizations like the UN. Um, so yeah, we support the Dutch companies with relevant expertise for projects financed by IFIs. Uh, and in that way, we contribute to sustainable, innovative and resilient development. Uh, of uh, emerging countries and developing countries. Um, so yeah, how do we do this? We organize many business opportunity seminars, incoming upcoming missions, brown bag sessions like today. Uh, in some say, cases, we finance small uh, finance small skill studies, training and learning weeks, but also informative webinars with local stakeholders, uh, but also advice on the use of Dutch bilateral instruments. Because as I just mentioned, RVO is a big organization with a lot of programs also on development aid, uh, also subsidies for uh, 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 also in developing and emerging countries. So uh, that are, those are instruments which you can combine. So for the ADB, just to have an idea, when could you approach uh, TO, our team? is in any, any way when you want to do an outreach to Dutch companies, uh, when you want to inform a sector or a cluster uh, of companies for upcoming tenders or events from the ADB, if you want to get introduced to specific innovations, um, but also on knowledge exchange. So if you want to have webinars on best practices, uh, we also in the history, we uh, organized quite some study trips to the Netherlands on specific niches in which the Dutch are good at, also with the World Bank, but it's also definitely something we are open to uh, with the ADB. So that is what I want to leave it up for to, to now. Uh, so then we can give the floor to our main guest, uh, Hans, who prepared the presentation for today. OK, thank you, Shu. Uh, let me share my screen now again. Does everybody see my screen? Yep, Is thanks, Hans. We, okay. we can see it. OK, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon to the audience in uh, Asia and good morning to the Dutch audience. Uh, I will have the honor today to present here a group of almost 30 Dutch companies and institutions active in the field of waste management, circular economy and green plastics. Uh, I thank them all very much for their input in my presentation. Most of them are here in the audience now and they will actively participate uh, in any questions and discussions later on. Uh, we made also a bid book with uh, some descriptions of these uh, companies and uh, um, institutions. And I hope that uh, Zhu will put it uh, in a link to this bid book um, in the chat. Um, my presentation comes with a working title, which is The Clockwork Orange. Uh, some of you may, of course, relate it to the uh, Stanley Kubrick movie from 1971, if you're old enough. 
Uh, but my analogy is more that of the Latin American nickname for the Dutch soccer team in its golden years, I have to say. It's about having the best players in the best team. Um, there's 45 minutes scheduled for my introduction, but I will try to keep it as short as possible to leave more room uh, for the uh, discussion. So first, uh, some general remarks about the Netherlands. Um, and I will try to put it in perspective to Asia. We are, of course, a very small country with the size of Bhutan. Uh, but all the same, we have a population of almost 18 million, like Kazakhstan, a GDP comparable, comparable to that of Indonesia, and exports on the same level as South Korea. So it looks we're doing quite well in many ways, but I don't want you to be intimidated by that because we really took our time. If we use urbanization as a proxy for our development in waste management, one could say that we were indeed rather slow, like many other high income countries. We took almost 700 years to go through the process of urbanization and countries like, for example, Indonesia had to cope and still have to cope with a similar urbanization in only 70 years, which is, of course, much more difficult. Orange is our national color. You knew that. And the clockwork stands for collaboration, teamwork and partnership. That's really in our genes and historians say that it comes from our history with uh, water. You maybe know that 55% of the country lies on or even below sea level. We had to fight the water and we couldn't do that as a bunch of individuals. It somehow shaped our democracy centuries ago. And still now our country shows many partnerships between governments, private businesses, academia and the public. We call that the quadruple helix. And examples are in high tech, in water management, chemistry, food, agriculture and logistics. But does this clockwork analogy also apply to integrated waste management? I think it does in many ways. Waste management is a needed utility in, in societies with many actors involved, and they all should work together closely with, within a divine space. And like a clockwork, it has to be energized from the outside to deliver results and to move ahead. One of the most important lessons that we learned is that there is a very close relation between finances waste management and circularity. Here in this chart, you see how waste management fees imposed on households increased in the last 30 years in our country. It started off when we introduced sanitary landfills and really jumped when introducing separate collection, composting and waste to energy. And when that increase came to an end, our government introduced taxes on landfills and waste to energy. And so we came from around 50 euros per household per year, and now we are at around 250 euros per household per year. All these measures together resulted in a steep reduction of landfill waste, coming from 14 million per, tons per year in 1990 to some two and a half million nowadays. <clears throat> in the same period, waste incineration, composting and digestion grew strongly as indicated in these blue and green lines. And nowadays, the recycling of paper, plastics, metals and glass from households has grown to almost 5 million tons per year. But maybe even more striking is the extent of recycling of construction and demolition waste and industrial waste. They add up to almost 40 million tons per year, representing some one, almost 100%. And in fact, these last figures 
are mostly caused by high gate fees for landfills and incineration facilities and strong taxation. So one may indeed say that strict waste management leads to high circularity. Another lesson we learned in the Dutch situation is that although we need partnerships, every actor has to play its own role. The first one is the role of the national government to demarcate the playing field by laws and regulations and to introduce incentives. The municipalities are the anchors, the fixed players uh, who more or less organize waste management on the ground, especially for municipal waste. Then there are the service providers, both private and public, who invest and operate, and without whom there is no hardware, recycling, and no progress. And then there is, of course, the vital role of the public and other waste producers who have to participate for which they are enabled, educated, rewarded, and enforced. Looking back at our waste management history, we can see that we went through a stage-wise development. Before 1850, there was virtually no waste management in our cities. Forced by growth, the municipalities saw the effect on health and started off by getting the waste out of the urban areas. But it wasn't until 1960 that we started to worry about the growth of waste volumes and the negative effects of open dumping. So we started to cooperate amongst municipalities to start up sanitary landfills and composting. And later, at the national level, we realized that resources and overall sustainability should be in the focus of our policies. This development can, of course, be found in any Western country. But when we took our knowledge abroad to other countries, we stumbled into situations that were, of course, very different from ours, but also somehow familiar. So if we replace this historic lens of time by the economic lens of income, we find a similar development. If we look at the Asian countries and plot them from low to high income, we may get this graph. Countries within the group of low and lower middle income are still focusing on city cleaning, collection and first attempts with sanitary landfills, while the other countries are already in the next stage with more national planning, substantial cash flows and more recycling. We drew a lesson from it. It is that we have to adapt ourselves our technologies and approaches to the development status in the countries we're working in. There is no one size fits all, no silver bullet. Nevertheless, there are some general lessons that we learned in the international arena so far. The first one is that waste management and circularity mostly starts in cities. And taking care of clean cities means we're also working at the root cause of marine plastics. Any development in this area should first take care of the waste management backbone of city cleaning, waste collection and safe disposal. And it should be designed with the right balance of technology and labor suitable to the country at stake. Sustainable finances are key based on cost recovery through municipal fees and gate fees are imperative. And for this, a good governance framework and political support is needed. We really advise to focus on total cost of ownership and not on lowest initial investments. In the end, our conclusion is almost always that good waste management is doable and affordable in all countries and that gate fees of landfills and incineration facilities are the best way to fire up recycling and circularity. Now let's switch to the Dutch companies and institutions in this presentation. Although it is tempting to think only in a, a circular concept, it may, it may be helpful to roll out the value chain. And it starts, of course, with prevention. 
But if not possible, we usually find this value chain consisting of city cleaning, waste collection, transfer and transport, recycling, recovery, as in waste to energy and disposal. The more elaborate uh, descriptions of the companies and the institutions are available by clicking on the link in the chat that I hope uh, Jules already provided. Let's have a first look at the companies on the front and side of the value chain then. In our group is Procomat. They design and produce smart street waste bins. They are solar powered with integrated compaction and web connection to call for needed emptying. It reduces costs and prevents overfilling. And they are already active in Singapore. Then we have VDL Translift. They are part of one of the largest family owned businesses in the Netherlands. The company produces collection vehicles with side load and crane systems. Perfectly fit for automated and underground containers in urban areas. All electric when needed. Safety, hygiene and low cost are the results and they're delivering it worldwide. Gesing Norba is a leading producer of world-class collection vehicles and static and mobile compaction systems. Rare loading and side loading options are available, as are their hybrid and all electric systems. Gesing Norba is already present in Singapore, Hong Kong and Indonesia. And then we have Haifa, also a worldwide provider of collection vehicles, compaction systems, container systems and transfer stations. They operate a dense network of production and maintenance facilities. And in Asia, they have offices in Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia and Australia. The next group is rather large with eight providers of recycling technology. The first one is Christians. They are world famous for their tunnel composting systems, fully automated if needed. They already delivered more than 1 million square meters of composting area worldwide, and their Asian activities already covered China, Korea, Vietnam, and India. Sweep Smart is a Dutch Indian company. They do the consulting, design, construction, and startup of modular sorting and recycling centers, including all needed training. From their Bangalore office, they already realized 11 projects in India and one in Indonesia. Colubrus, they specialize in integrated sorting and separation facilities and already designed and constructed more than 100 systems worldwide. They're now also expanding in facilities for extracting proteins from organic waste. Granuband is the Dutch market leader in collection and recycling of used tires. They produce a number of new rubber end products from it, such as tiles and roofing materials. Now they are offering their high-end production technology to the world. And then we have Royal Custos Engineering. Custos specializes in destruction equipment for banknotes and coins, in dewatering technology for paper recycling, and in insect breeding facilities for organic waste. They already installed over 700 systems in 80 countries worldwide. Orga World are or is already very active in Asia with projects in Myanmar, China and Indonesia. They develop, build and operate biotreatment facilities for organic municipal waste, manure and agricultural waste. Their services include the marketing and sales of organic fertilizers. Van Werven is the top plastics recycler of the Netherlands. They are producing more than 150,000 tons of fresh plastic flakes per year from rigid plastic waste such as PE, PP and PVC. Van Werven is active across Europe and at this moment they are also open for Asian projects. The last one in this group is Despre. 
They are providing recycling technologies for aerosol cans. The technology offers 100% capture of the gases and liquids and 100% recycling of the metals. In Asia, they are working from their offices in Thailand and Indonesia. Then on to recovery and disposal. We have six companies in our group who specialize on waste to energy and landfills. Harvest Waste is our provider of high efficiency waste incineration technology. They develop large scale facilities and also provide financing and operations. Their electricity output is 25% higher than conventional methods making it carbon negative and economically feasible. Offices are in Manila, Karachi and Delhi. Blue Phoenix takes the incinerator bottom ash as their feedstock. From it, they separate all metals and turn the remaining ash into an aggregate for construction. They're operating across Europe and in the US, Australia and Singapore treating an annual four and a half million tons in total per year. Afalsorg is the largest uh, operator of landfills in the Netherlands. They offer their experiences and knowledge on landfill man management and especially on landfill gas extraction as a consultancy and as a training service. Their Asian projects so far were in Indonesia and Myanmar. Multiwell installs landfill gas extraction systems worldwide and their technology uses intensive perforation of the waste body of landfills leading to higher gas extractions in a shorter time. Not yet active in Asia, but very much interested to do so. Their sister organization is Trisoplast. They developed a mineral layer uh, a liner based on bentonite and polymers used for gas and watertight covering of landfills. Projects have been successfully executed in 20 countries, including projects in China, Malaysia and Singapore. And the last one in this group is Hofstetter. They are the world's leading specialist in dedicated technology for landfill gas extraction, treatment and flaring. They installed more than 1900 systems around the world and among them are project projects in China, Taipei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, Cambodia and Hong Kong. The last group can be characterized as the oil in the clockwork. Uh, the researchers and consultants and developer, uh, developers that assess, warn, analyze, integrate and appraise. There are 10 in our group today. Royal Huskoding de Hafe is one of the largest consultancy and engineering firms from the Netherlands. They're involved in a number of projects on waste to energy, cleanup technologies and riverine and marine plastics in Southeast Asia. Uh, but also in Australia and on the Pacific Islands. The Rebel Group prides itself for combining consultancy and investments, waste management, circular economy policies and port operations are solid parts of their portfolio and they did projects across 16 Asian countries with an office in Indo Indonesia. Then we have Delta Ares. Their edge is the interface between waste and water, and they lead the international field when it comes to researching, monitoring and modeling plastic sources and dispersion into rivers and seas. With offices in Indonesia, Singapore, Vietnam and Australia, they already are very active in Asia. The Open University in the Netherlands covers a broad range of research topics going from waste management to circular economy and plastic pollution. And together with UNEP, they run an extensive program on online training, master classes and train the trainer programs on marine litter in 10 languages. 
projects run in Indonesia and in the Kopsi region. Then we have the Wageningen University and the Wageningen Food and Bio-Based Research in Institute. Internationally active in recycling technologies, circular economy and packaging, food chain, bio-based and marine plastics, but also covering social, organizational and governance aspects. Indonesia, Vietnam, China, India, Malaysia and Singapore, Singapore are among the countries where they worked. Invest International is the Dutch Organization for International Development Funding. They support our companies and projects abroad, support exports and join in government to government projects. As a public entity, they work closely with all Dutch embassies abroad. The Holland Circular Hotspot is a Dutch PPP broadcasting the importance of circular economy in the international arena. The hotspot promotes a network of platforms around the world, bringing together business, institutes and authorities that promote circular produ production and consumption. consumption. Their projects are in Indonesia, Malaysia, China, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Japan and Taipei. FB Basic is a dedicated circular economy enabler. They develop strategies and tech applications for SMEs and corporates. Product passports and dashboards are designed to enable visual monitoring of the performance of circular products in Europe, but if needed also in Asia. Export promotion of the European environmental industry is at the heart and mind of Metasus. With studies, missions and matchmaking, Metasus connects parties in this field around the world. They ran many multi-year collaboration projects on waste management and circular economy. The most recent, one, recent ones being in Iran, Ghana, Indonesia and Australia. And then finally, Brad. My own company is providing waste management consultancy support to cities and regions around the world. My specialty is designing and implementing basic waste management infrastructure and services in low and middle income countries. In Asia, I ran and run projects in Myanmar, Cambodia, Turkey and Lebanon. Our message for today is that we can be of great value to ADB and your member countries, but it's always in changing coalitions and combinations, depending on the issues at stake. So if we now try to plot these companies and institutions along the value chain, we find that on the prevention side, there are the Wageningen University, FB Basic, and of course, the Holland Circular Hotspot. On city cleaning, we have Procomart, and on collection, transfer, transport, and overall logistics, we find Haifa, Gisignorba, and VDL Translift. Then on the recycling, we find a large group of eight companies with their specialties on tires, aerosol cans, organic waste, plastic waste, etc. And when it comes to energy, metals, and aggregates from res residual waste, we have Harvest Waste and the Blue Phoenix Group. And for landfill operations, this group of Affelsor, Hofstetter, Multipel, and Trisoplast. And finally, we have these eight companies and institutions for research and consultancies. Another angle is the position of these partners in the development stages. Then we find, of course, the companies working on city cleaning and collection are at the front end for low income countries who are still working on trying to achieve clean cities. But also here we find the consultancies and institutions who are working on basic waste services, prevention, littering and modeling and monitoring. Gradually, cities' responsibilities grow and subsequently the interest will also include the companies on disposal and recovery. And this leads to higher costs and gate fees, which 
together with policies and regulations may lead to interest in the recycling companies. And eventually also a deeper felt interest in prevention and circular economy. Consultancy engineering and financing is of course a relevant part throughout this development. But please bear in mind, but please bear in mind that this is not sequential, but all additional. So even in later stages, you need, of course, collection, city cleaning and landfills. And also, I don't want to suggest that developing countries should not have an interest in circular economy. In fact, many of them do, and their results on recycling uh, and, uh, and their results on recycling, mostly through the informal sector. Uh, and their results may sometimes be quite astonishing. The important thing is that we have to be realistic also. You cannot leapfrog from a situation with very poor waste collection into a circular economy in one step. The waste hierarchy is of course only about policies ranking for different methods of treating waste. But still, it provides another angle to look at what we have to offer. Maybe good to know that this hierarchy was first formulated like this by the Dutch Member of Parliament, Ad Lonsink, more than 40 years ago. And still now, after 40 years, as we saw, we need sanitary landfills as a part of our waste management backbone. Zero waste is a beautiful perspective, but we're still glad we have some fine companies in our group whose focus is to make landfills as sanitary, as, as sanitary as possible. The same holds for the recovery activities of Harvest Waste and Blue Phoenix. Waste to energy is not a panacea, but it will remain an important part of the value chain for many years to come. And after 40 years, the recycling part of the hierarchy is very rep well represented by these Dutch companies. And the top of the hierarchy is maybe not so crowded with companies and institutions, but that should not come as a surprise, as prevention and circularity must be done by the producers themselves and by nature cannot be outsourced. Uh, logistics are important all through the pyramid as they are part of the supply chain and the same holds for the supply of financing and knowledge. So now summer, let's summarize our presence in Asia. It turns out that many of our participants already have established dealerships or even their own offices in Asia. It looks a bit like we have our own Silk Road, although I can assure you that there is no plan behind this. The projects of our participants are of course much wider spread over the continent and especially in ADB's working area. So in preparation uh, to this meeting, I went through ADB's pathways and flagships on waste management, circular economy and marine pollution. And I'm not sure whether I am complete and whether I use exactly the right phrasing but the focus of ADB, in my view, seems to be in redesigning products to produce less weight, uh, waste, initiatives within communities to reduce transports, digitization to enhance logistics, treatment and financing, and linked to that one, web augmented EPR, EPR systems, the promotion of supply chains for recycling and upcycling, investments in eco parks and green ports and linked to that one waste to energy and treatment of residues then the upgrading of landfill operations and more in general coastal resiliency healthy oceans law enforcement and governance we sincerely think we can add value to, to these ambitions but we also want to be very realistic we can jumpstart, but we cannot leapfrog. Waste management is not like telecommunication, which would take us directly from no phones to smartphones. We have to go through all the stages of the development. 
And it's not easy. We need to ha work hard and collaborate. Public-private partnerships are essential, especially in this sector. As said, there is no one-size-fits-all. Every country and every situation needs tailored solutions. And along comes that also the co co coalitions have to be customized. Our companies and institutions focus on high quality of proven technologies and believe that total cost of ownership is more important than initial investments. And for this, we want to add all our knowledge in lasting operations. To conclude, this presentation, two more slides with some thoughts on possible coalitions around the ambitions of ADB. For riverine and marine pollution monitoring and mitigation, we would suggest the Open University, Royal Haskoning DHV, Deltares and the Wageningen University, as they are able to contribute with really the international best practices cross-cutting studies and a vast international network. Circular concepts, product redesign, platform developments and e-concepts could be best in the professional hands uh, of the Holland Circular Hotspot, FB Basic and the Wageningen Food and Bio-Based Institute. We are sure that Sweep Smart is really coming with a needed mindset for connecting recycling facilities with community-based initiatives based on their experiences on this topic in developing countries. And our partners from Haifa, Gesink, Norba, VDL, Translift and Procomart are your natural partners if you want to develop e-connected log logistics and the lowest cost of ownership. Our partners from Custus, Colubris, Christians, Granuband, Van Werven, Orgewold, Despre and Sweep Smart are able to work with you on very generic and very specialized solutions, integrated in supply chain and sales and with the right balance between labor and investments. Green ports and eco parks could well be a proposition of Harvest Waste, Blue Phoenix and Rebel as they are able to provide these developments as design, finance, build, operate and maintain. The COP26 priority on methane mitigation has put landfills back on the main stage. And it is indeed the priority of this group with Hofstetter, Multrivel, Trisoplast and Afelsorg. And as you know, there is no development without policies, planning, financing and promotion for which Invest International, Metasus, Rebel and Brad can be your best partners. So this is what we from the Netherlands have to offer ADB, a collaborative approach. No time to waste. Thank you for your attention. Wow, wow. That was, that uh, was fantastic, Hans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jules, do you want to say anything or do you want me to hand over to you at the end? Yeah, if you could hand me over to the end, that's fine. Thanks, Steve. OK, so um, just some initial comments and some feedback. Um, uh, I think one line that uh, you said was gate fee fires up circular economy. Let me translate that out of the Dutch a little bit because um, there is that in, um, the gap. I think what gate fees do is they allow the bar to be high enough that people can make more money recycling or upcycling or recovering materials than sending to a waste to energy plant or sending them to a landfill. And I th the, that that model's good. The problem we have is if the landfill fee is high, then it incentivizes waste to energy, which is what we don't quite want to do. What we want to do is keep waste to energy in a a space where it can be used where it's for things we can't otherwise uh, uh, use for recycling and upcycling. Um, a few of the people on this call were actually are actually involved in the development of a uh, an Excel planning tool which looks at expanding on these integrated supply chains and looking at the hundred actions across the waste hierarchy <clears throat> from EPR to 
uh, landfill by landfill gas, sending materials to cement kilns, all these sorts of activities across 150 different parameters like energy, land use, um, UPOPs, the creation of unintended persistent organic pollutants. So what's interesting to see is that the work you're doing sort of fits in pretty well with the direction we're going. Um, and, and I really liked your slide, where in the value chain, because it really demonstrates that it's not just urban, it's not just energy, it's not climate change, it's it's all of the above. And the thing that I liked most of your presentation is that you 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 picked up on the global methane challenge, which is a big deal because uh, methane now is three times the concentration it was at the start of the industrial revolution. And methane's 21 times more, 22 times more damaging than CO2. So um, be very, very interested to hear more from the companies looking at alternative proteins and BSF and also the folks looking at BMT and landfills. That would be, uh, I know Alex Nash, who's made some comments in the uh, uh, the chat is very interested in that. And perhaps I might ask Alex after this to follow up with some comments and his thoughts. But uh, I really appreciate that it's an integrated approach. And I think if you can, if we can keep talking to you and maybe introduce you to people on the ground who you can work with through conferencing or through blogs or through other engagement, which is part of our remit, um, we can help you get your technology into the field and help us to change things. Alex, do you want to say a little bit about landfills? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, although in this group of people, I won't be teaching anybody anything. Um, we have a, we have in Cambodia, um, we, we have quite a, a, a big urban portfolio. I work in the urban team of, of Southeast Asia, although I'm a water engineer. For my sins, I'm getting dragged into solid waste. Um, but but it interests me, and 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 as as you all know, it's a massive problem. It's sort of neglected, which is something which we're trying to fix, uh, and that's why we're on this call today. And we thank you very much for a, a really good presentation, Hans. So in Cambodia, we're working in all of the provincial capitals, essentially, uh, where we're building a series of uh, sewers, wastewater treatment plants, uh, stormwater drains, and in an integrated approach, which I think is, is is good to see, solid waste is being systematically included in these projects, mainly because of its effect, I think, on stormwater and stormwater drains. Because we want the drains to work, we realise we have to do uh, solid waste as well, which is encouraging. Um, but it is, to some extent, sort of tacked on to projects. It's not the centre of our focus, if you like. It's sort of tacked on. So we could be doing more and, and perhaps approaching the problem more holistically. If you like, we're coming at it from a... Uh, a water management perspective rather than a circular economy perspective. Uh, and so we're keen to improve, I think, the offering that we do. But yeah, there's, there's, uh, for example, I think there's a lot we could be doing in waste collection uh, on supporting collection. We're building landfills, but we're not sure, you know, to what extent uh, the solid waste will get into them. That's a much harder problem to solve than building a hole in the ground. As you can imagine, so yeah, I'd be and 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 I'm in Hanoi. We we're looking at um, how we could support that area in Vietnam. I know far more about Cambodia's solid waste sector than I do about Vietnam. So that's why my invitation was there for those of you who are present in Vietnam. I, I really need, um, if you've got time and the patience to educate me, um, I would really appreciate it. And then hopefully we can come up with something that um, makes sense and and come up with an offering to to propose to our Vietnamese counterparts. Thanks, Alex. James, you want to say something? James Baker? Uh, I will do if I can get myself off mute. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so no, it, it's very interesting. I know that Del Tar has, has um, already done some work with the ISWA looking at plastic calculators, and it's an area that we are interested in as ADB working with, with international groups to achieve baselines for um, pollution monitoring, uh, particularly for me for plastic pollution monitoring, but also modeling how um, different interventions, different policies can support that work. Uh, Steve referred to the, the digital calculator that we're building to help with exactly that, but I think it, it's an interesting area that I, I think several of the, the Dutch companies are involved in. 
of bringing together these digital solutions, these digital modeling, um, and even taking it further into machine learning and, and those aspects to help us not only understand the world we, we live in better, but also start to predict and project how the different policy changes, the different investments work together to solve the solutions. So, so not so much of a question, Steve, as, as an observation and a, an open invitation for future discussions. Thank you. James, do you want to put your contact, uh, and Alex, you might want to put your contact details in the chat for our Dutch friends. Um, one of the things that you that was touched on just now by Dennis Eagers in the, the call is total cost of ownership and the cost versus quality argument. Um, I, I probably just need to do a minute and a half on ADB's procurement policies. So ADB um, typically used to pro procure on least cost. Now that has changed. So if you have a higher quality presentation um, and with lower risk, then there is a greater opportunity that you will be sub uh, uh, selected for sovereign operations. So when we mean sovereign operations, Alex Nash runs, um, works for the sovereign operations group where we lend money to governments. Governments then, uh, we help them put together projects and they will procure work within ADB's guidelines. Um, and then what will happen is that we'll be made a decision on procurement. To be in that game, you've got to be registered on our, on our ADB website. And I think Jules and Hans will take you through the requirement to register both as a company and as an individual for services and it also for consulting. I'm not quite sure of the share that uh, that the Netherlands has in terms of ADB procurement, but I think it is significant. Um, and that perhaps might be something that Jules can comment on the end as well. But um, where the opportunities, they're, they're not just procurement opportunities for projects. There's also knowledge work and engaging in piloting, which is the work that James and I do. Um, and then there's another area, which is the private sector operations, where we may invest in a local corporate, perhaps, which uh, a Dutch company is uh, engaging with. Um, and in fact, we had discussions with Harvest before they were called Harvest along those very lines that there was an opportunity to potentially take part in a investment in an ADB developing member country. Um, so they're the, the ways that you can engage with ADB. And then the other way is to engage on private-public partnerships where ADB may be the mandate holder for for putting together a PPP, and so bids would be submitted to a bid agency which ADB would be advise, advising on. So there's a number of opportunities, and I think um, one of the things that is very interesting to me is to know if there's an opportunity for our private sector ventures group to potentially look at some of the more innovative things um, things like uh, black soldier flies and protein from waste. Protein from waste is going to be a, a huge issue. I remember as a young man watching Solient Green and watching Charlton Heston make the first reference in Hollywood to climate change, which some of you will be old enough to remember. I actually have that film on a DVD, which I carry with me and show people whenever I can. I see a lot of people smiling because, you know, they're, they're my age group. Um, but uh, the ways to engage with ADB, and if I notice Alex Burrell has mentioned, uh, has mentioned, made a comment, and I might call on Alex just to talk briefly a little bit about private sector, if you could, Alex. Is she there? Hi. Yes, Good. I'm, I'm here. Um, I was asking the question. <laughs> so okay. uh, we, we find waste to energy projects very difficult to implement. Um, in Asia, and my question is largely stems around the Philippines, where there's this large underground economy of garbage pickers who make a lot of money. There's a lot of fragmented garbage collectors, etc. So it's proved to be desperately needed to have some kind of solution for collection of waste, and yet at the same time, it's very difficult to do the right thing in terms of. Um, keeping these people employed. And, and I think the other big issue is, of course, that the the, the, the operating costs of these projects may come about 70 percent of of um, the cost of the operating costs of projects that have been proposed. So their economics are marginal. And I think the social impact on taking away business from uh, garbage pickers, for example, is, is, is extremely complicated. So I wanted to know whether or not that has been addressed successfully somewhere. 
in one of your projects or if you have any proposed solutions. <laughs> Yes, I think that's you. Maybe, yeah, I think I will. I will uh, uh, answer this question. Thank you uh, for the for the question. Um, I think first of all, if I understand why, uh, right, is is uh, you are afraid if when you are implementing waste to energy that you would put people uh, out of business, the waste pickers, uh, etc. Um, is that your question? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and it's uh, fragmented. There's so many of them. It's almost sometimes it can be even mafia like in its uh, control. No, I, I totally understood, and 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 I think it, it starts with the with the uh, uh, idea that you, you you will not put these people out of out of work, and and I think uh, also what this presentation shows is that, um, for instance, a company like SweepSmart, who is at the beginning of sorting and organizing the sorting in a in a more uh, proper way uh, can work easily together with us as a uh, as a waste to energy uh, provider because as it is shown also in the Netherlands it is not in competition with each other so recycling is not in competition with uh, waste to energy waste to energy is a back-end solution for things which cannot be recycled anymore um, and if you start from the thinking of that, that it is complementary instead of uh, in competition with each other, uh, then you have, have a whole new uh, starting point. And then uh, it is good to mention that uh, we know each other very well and we know where we can uh, complement each other and, where, uh, and, and that we are almost, we, we, are, we are not in competition with each other. And I think one of the great things uh, uh, SweetSmart does is they organize the, the sorting and the, and the recycling options in a much better way than as they do now. Uh, currently, they are working on landfills in a very bad situation, very unhealthy, uh, very dangerous also. Uh, or they're uh, picking on the streets, which is also with all these, uh, it's not efficient also. And if FeedSmart comes in, uh, for instance, they introduce a, a solution. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, FeedSmart is also in the in the in the in the room here, so she can she can explain so much better than I do, uh, which makes it more safe for the people, uh, but also more efficient, so they make more money as well. And then still, there will be a lot of residual waste left, which needs to be treated uh, otherwise, which can go through incineration. So it's this thinking we have to get off, that it is in competition with each other. It is complementary to each other. OK, um, I've got a few questions to answer for Sylvia was talking about waste collection, uh, supporting local waste collectors. Uh, we have a couple of ways we can do that. Um, but we aren't, to be frank, we haven't got into that space yet. Um, and one of the ways we do it is a way called financial intermediation, which is where we will lend 25% of capital to a particular bank in a particular country for a particular theme. And then that, that, for instance, might be upgrading waste and supporting waste supply chains. And ADB, if there's, say, a $400 million facility, ADB would put in $100 million and then other partners would put in money. And then that would then be used to finance some of those activities. In some countries, I think that would be a good business, but we haven't made the business case for that yet. But given the methane challenge and all the challenges with methane for COP, I think we are moving in that direction. So I think that there is an opportunity that possibly that possibly may occur. We're probably 18 to 24 months away from it happening. Um, Ronald asked a question about project sponsors. ADB typically does not uh, introduce uh, companies to each other because that is a reputational risk for us. However, if you were at a conference, for instance, like the recent Healthy Oceans Conference, or perhaps the uh, Asian Clean Energy fin uh, Energy Forum in June, you would probably meet some of these people. And if you were at a conference and someone said, you said, uh, I would like to meet somebody, uh, I'm sure there will be people who, who will speak who you can get access to. So part of our mandate is to engage and introduce. For instance, Sietzer and I know one another because of engagement 
through the league road very well, which was came through the Asian Clean Energy Forum. So again, it's just a matter of going conferencing, meeting people, and you can expand your network. We are very keen for everyone to succeed, but we do have our we do have fiduciary responsibilities as an international finance institution. There are some things we can't do. Um, now, Sietz, I'm going to throw a question back to you. Um, Sujata, who's the head of energy and water in um, uh, in urban in uh, East Asia, has asked a question about minimal waste, the size of minimum waste, uh, the minimum size of waste to energy facilities. And I think that's probably best answered in terms of uh, uh, eco-industrial parks and looking at the types of technologies. So perhaps I might ask um, you to say a few words and then Sujata can possibly come and ask a follow up question. OK. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, if we talk about minimum size of, of, of uh, waste to energy plants, it's, it, it's, it's also always related to the economy of scale. Uh, eventually, uh, the overall aim for waste management is to keep societal costs as low as possible because waste management always comes at a cost. So, therefore, the bigger the plants, the the, the 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 lower overall cost will be. Um, so minimum sizes we are always talking is around. Uh, we started around 750 tons per day uh, plants. But um, to create a eco park, you need uh, more waste because, as I mentioned before, um, waste to energy is not a competition with recycling. It's an it's it's it, it, it provides a final sink for uh, not uh, not treated waste, and um, around these uh, facilities, you can you can start with uh, upcycling and recycling uh, industries, uh, which is also shown in the Netherlands. That uh, yeah, we call it eco parks uh, around uh, uh, these these facilities that um, you create a natural. Uh, flow for waste streams, and these waste streams ca then can be treated uh, and upcycled. So um, I think that's 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 good to to understand because in that in that fact you can um, yeah keep transport costs low, um, but also um, you create a facility where where a, a, a lot of treatment can be can take uh, place, and it, it's it's you have to. Uh, organize it in a so efficient as possible way in order to keep the cost down. Okay, so Jata, would you want to have a follow up question and maybe pr preference to talk about a little bit with the work you're doing? Right, thanks, thanks, uh, Stephen, uh, and uh, thank you for a very informative presentation. Where my question was coming from was, uh, you know, if we st uh, start looking at mid-sized cities and small cities and uh, really looking at the whole issue as a prevention uh, you know rather than trying to cure a waste uh, situation as we had for example uh, in manila we have a mountain of waste already uh, you know here so if uh, one was looking not at the larger cities but the mid-sized cities and what would be the best approach there and uh, maybe my question was uh, partly incorrect. I didn't want to say, I would rather say waste management rather than saying waste to energy. What would be, uh, yes, I realize that there are economies of scale, but can we consider these uh, maybe integrated waste management uh, solutions or waste to energy or waste recycling for mid-sized cities? Yep, and I think the question is going to be how we do the consulting because that raises an interesting point, Sajata, that the people that would do it cannot do the consulting advice. So if, for instance, we were to want to implement a solution which might choose from two or three companies or maybe three or four companies who we think are very good in a particular activity like waste to energy, that company cannot write the spec. It's a, it's, we're not allowed to do that internally at ADB. So it's a case of you know that that these companies are aware of each other's activities is a really good point for us. So the question, here, it probably isn't aimed at you. It's probably aimed at your colleagues in Deltares and some of the other folks. Yeah. 
Thank you. Maybe I could make a small remark to that one. Please, Hans. OK, uh, just short. Um, in the Netherlands, we have something like 15 incineration facilities for a population of 18 million. Uh, whereas we only have uh, mid-size and small cities. We don't have these large size cities like uh, Manila or other. So the thing is that in the Netherlands, we said, well, we have to collaborate uh, to make this all possible. So, and that's also what could happen in other countries is that even small size cities and medium sized cities can work together uh, to make possible, let's say, one larger facility somewhere in the middle. And that's more a question of logistics and transfer stations uh, than, uh, let's say, that we have to downsize incineration facilities. That's not the case. You have to upsize collaboration. Oh, that's a good point. That's a very good way to say it. Thanks, okay. Hans. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that's key. That that was indeed, as Hans said, that was key all from the development uh, in the Netherlands, and 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 it's more an optimization of logistics and and have local sorting uh, implemented, and then you only have to transport the residuals to a larger facilities, and there you can collaborate with uh, different cities. Well, thank you. Okay, I have a few quick questions. By the way, the chat's fantastic. This is the most active chat I think I've ever had. Um, so. Uh, for Roger, um, thank you for your comments on the down, the bid book. You can download everybody. Please remember that at the start of the chat, Jules gave a link to the bid book. Download that. That's a very useful piece of information and all the contact details. Um, the other thing about energy from waste having a sanitation benefit, we when we did the energy policy, which the AED referenced, um, one of the challenges was that how do we balance the uh, sanitation and energy benefits worth versus the potential carbon emissions and the uh, the impact of persistent organic pollutants and captured fly ash. Um, the emissions from uh, gaseous emissions are one issue, but what do we do with the stuff that we catch in the fly ash? And I, I might ask Sietze to add, add on to this because I, I know he's made a few breakthroughs in it. But for us, one of the challenges is a lot of the companies in the region are not so diligent in how they deal with fly ash. And that is a big concern for us because that's why we want to downsize. So when we re released a book last year or two years ago, we said, look, if you're making waste to energy anything over 35 percent of your total waste, there has to be a very good reason. And that's what we reference when we talk about that, the prudent order of management in the energy policy. Um, and so I, I take your point, but we we, we have to manage the, the competing policy elements. For instance, do we maximize landfills versus maximizing uh, 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 waste to energy? And of course, the answer is we try and minimize both by maximizing recycling and upcycling. So Sietze, do you want to talk a little bit about fly ash? Because that's a really important issue in this space. Yeah, I think if we talk about bottom ash, and Gier maybe uh, can, can better answer that question, but just shortly on fly ash. Fly ash, is, 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 indeed, it's, it's really important that we treat that uh, properly. And, and if it comes to waste of energy, it also comes to policies around it. So you have to make sure that your emission standards are, uh, are at a level at least at what we have in the European uh, directives now. Because if you um, if you give slack on that part, you still will polluting your environment. Uh, because if your emissions are not up to standard, uh, your dioxins will get back you to your crops and you will create another problem, uh, definitely. Uh, not mentioning uh, the POPs ending up in the oceans if you're uh, on an island. Um, so that's very important. But if you increase these uh, uh, parameters, you you are also um, creating more uh, fly ash, and the fly ash needs to be treated uh, very properly. This is actually the very back end of your process, and it is accumulating all your all the hazardous components which is in the waste. Uh, which will be eventually less than 1% of the total income of the waste, but still it's there and it is toxic. So uh, you have to treat it and you have to immobilize it in such a way and store it in such a way that it will not uh, uh, cause problems uh, uh, anywhere, of, uh, uh, any, any more problems in the future. And there are uh, now also um, 
possibilities to treat it and to um, and to have it recycled and immobilized in such a way that we can reuse it in in in, uh, in a proper way. But maybe Rogier, you also have some something to add to this. Uh, Thank you, Sitze. Yes, happy to to share some thoughts. Um, let me first say, uh, if we look at waste problems, it's all about reduction of waste to landfill. And at first, if you look to the history, energy from waste started to uh, being implemented to reduce waste volumes. And then you, uh, you, you end up with 20, 25 percent of residual waste from which only one or two, three percent would be fly ash. And I fully support Sietze that to date um, there's not no better alternative than uh, landfilling that in a proper manner, in an immobilized manner. It's definitely part of our research eh, as a solution provider for ash residues in the waste to energy sector. We're definitely studying that, but to date we didn't find any economic viable solution because there are technical solutions, but they are definitely not yet economically viable. So our focus remains um, to reduce the bottom ash to landfill to zero to extract all uh, metals in a proper manner and upgrade them to a level that it can be directly sold back into the smelter industry as a as a alternative for ores which also helps to uh, um, uh, lessen the depletion of the earth and then focus on the mineral aggregates to be used as a construction material or to replace primary gravel and sand in concrete production, concrete products production. Um, fly ash um, remains, let's say, the the, um, the last resort of all the real uh, high contaminant elements. Um, so therefore, it's it's a dirty uh, a dirty fraction which we have to be careful of, and also trying to recycle that. Hmm. It's a challenge. It's a challenge yeah. we took on. And um, yeah, so be happy to share further technical thoughts, but maybe too far for now. Um, to tell you the truth, that's fantastic, because one of the things that worries us in the energy group the most is um, are we building plants that and then are not having fly ash managed correctly? And I, um, flue grass scrubbing, yes, Alex, the, uh, or, Air pollution control residues is another way of talking about them. Um, okay. But when you when you look at this, we're very keen to see if we can collaborate with you. For instance, we were approached by another Dutch company that was looking at plasma gasification, and we asked them, can you co-fire fly ash to make a ceramic? And they couldn't come back to us. Part of our job is to test bed some of these opportunities and identify, can we do something that can fix this problem? Right. So there's a, almost a university component of some of the work we do in the sustainable development climate change. So, Roger, I think you and I are probably going to be talking a lot more over the next two months. OK, I will be ha happy to share some thoughts. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's also a matter of uh, economically be viable to recycle because we have to bear in mind that all the recycling and now my dog's making sound um, that, all the re <laughs> that all the recycling um, efforts also cost a lot of energy. So on a global yep. scale and on the total life cycle assessment, we have to look at um, where do we go with recycling and efforts to clean stuff compared to putting that money into a circular economy to design products for recycling? Our company is a spin off yeah. of the Technical University in Delft, and the professor Peter M always says um, we have to, uh, we do not, we should not look for technologies to recycle products that are not meant to be recycled. Yeah, but 100%. go back to the go back to the to the drawing board and start designing products that can be better recycled and just take the last 20 years. Uh, as Franz Timmermans, our European commissioner, says 2050, we need to be fully circular, but it can only be reached by changing our production and our thought of how to use raw materials. For us, it leaves another 30 years with a need for energy from waste, not 100% of the waste flows, definitely not, but a certain yeah. percentage. And then with proper ash management, we could come to a better a better economy. So we'll, we'll try to put something to the table. I sincerely hope you're registered on our CMS system. I guess so, but if not, let's check. <laughs> yeah, no, you should be, because I think I need your help. Um, OK, so going to the next question, um, Dennis mentioned, uh, talked about uh, his technology. Dennis, I have a question for you. Has your technology been used to remediate contaminated sites? 
I hope Dennis is still on the call. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you can. Ah, OK, very good. Thank you for your question, uh, Stephen. Uh, yes, well, uh, we have two technologies which were in the presentation of Hans. Hans, thank you for the presentation, by the way. Uh, it's the Trisoplast mineral lining system and the Multruel gas extraction system. Now, uh, both um, technologies are very useful for remediation of uh, existing dump sites and landfills. Uh, whereas uh, trisoplast is the isolating uh, material to isolate the landfill uh, from the environment, so top covering or bottom lining for new landfills. And the gas extraction technology is uh, specifically designed to, in a very quick and clean way, install gas extraction uh, uh, technology in landfills to take out the gas and uh, uh, prevent methane emissions. So yes, remediation of existing landfills is typically uh, uh, suitable for multi well technology. Okay. My my question was if you had a contaminated site which was not necessarily a landfill, mm -hmm. but perhaps might be chemically co contaminated, but we needed to protect the community from the existing contaminants. Could you cover that and then use uh, bioremediation technologies to flow yeah, water well, through in, an inspector? In, in, uh, in that case, yeah. In if you look at uh, remediation sites, then uh, our technology for uh, Trisoplast is the mineral liner that could isolate such uh, uh, contaminants from the environment. And we then cooperate usually with uh, technology providers who do uh, bio cleaning or uh, do aeration, for example, or uh, do uh, water extraction and uh, clean that uh, specifically. But that, then we partner with companies to do that. Our job is to prevent leakage of uh, any pollutants to the environment. OK, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, I'm really starting to run out of, I've really lost control of the questions, I must admit, which is a great thing because it means there's lots of questions and there's lots of side discussions. Um, I was just going to say, if anybody wants to say anything, um, please put your hand up. You can use the uh, raise your hand function. And if you just want to say anything, I'm very happy to have people engage. I know there are diversity of views within the audience. Um, and I'm inviting anybody if they'd like to put their hand up and speak. I'm very happy to uh, or ask a question. Please go ahead. Steve, just maybe uh, to to uh, short mention, I think uh, also given the time, maybe we have around three to five questions and then we would like to have a little bit of time for the, the follow up. Uh, because I think it, it won't stop here. OK, all right. Um, well, I'm, I think everyone's a bit shy, but um, uh, James, could I just ask you to follow on just with a bit of commentary on EPR and some of the things that you've talked about in the chat? Yeah, so I was I was I was I was just answering hands and pretending to be you because you're busy. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we are as ADB, as circular economists within ADB, we are working across uh, predominantly across Southeast Asia looking at the opportunities for EPR, obviously, particularly in Indonesia, as you saw in the chat, um, and trying to work with governments, with manufacturers, with communities to, to find the mechanics of how EPR can work and how we can build trust within the uh, plastics value chain to allow it to work. One of the challenges that we've seen um, across Southeast Asia is sort of a reluctance to pay a tax without clarity on exactly what that revenue is going to be used for. Um, so it, it's an interesting aspect of working working within the plastics value chain to see how we can get EPR to work. We can demonstrate that it won't cause um, market disruption. It won't cause skewing of the markets. One of the challenges we have is with um, taxation or, or EPR systems being levied differently against importers and against, against domestic producers. So it, it's it's a very interesting, it's not a very simple activity, but it's a very interesting activity. And, and again, we keep coming back to these digital solutions. And that was something I was just answering to Hans to say that we, you know, we're looking at how we model this. How can we predict the activities? How can we predict the failure points as we start to implement EPR um, and similar controls, similar 
uh, restrictions on plastics. I mean, I've, I was l recently looking at an island state where the bans on single use plastics have essentially destroyed the domestic recycling market. So you've got a very positive outcome on one hand, but a very negative outcome on the on, on, on the other hand. So it, it's um, yeah, I'm, I'm waffling a bit and I apologize for that, but it's it's a complex it's a complex area that I enjoy looking at and I enjoy working with and trying to model. But it is something that is very central to what we want to do at ADB with our circular economy approach, both on terrestrial plastics and on marine plastics. Um, and I welcome the conversations. I've, I've, a couple of people have reached out in the chat to move that forward um, and very open to sort of future conversations about how technologies, how solutions at different levels of the value chain can support that process and, and try and help maintain that balance. Thanks, James. And, and just carrying that forward, I think uh, one of the great things about this chat today with RVO is not only are we talking to, to the, the particular companies, but we're also talking to the government agency that's involved. And I think when we start talking about sharing success stories, I really like the the way that it was pitched and that this takes time. We had a recent, we had a presentation from Taipei two years ago, and they mentioned it took them 40 years to get to where they were. They, it was a long journey and their journey very much mirrors yours. Um, so um, it was just very interesting to see who's winning and who's doing doing well in this space. Um, getting part of ADB's job is to do some of the advocacy to engage with governments and tell them what they've done well. And um, we you, we may actually call upon you during various activities for some of your your companies to present. Um, and this video will be online, and in fact will be the first video loaded up onto a new thematic track or a new um, working group that we're working on on the circular economy. It's not confirmed yet, but uh, when it is, this will be the first video launched. So I thank RVO and I thank the AED for uh, putting this together. So Jules, on that note, I'd like to hand over to you and you can perhaps close out. Yes, great. Thanks, Steve. And uh, something you mentioned earlier in the presentation of uh, in your talks about uh, the amount of uh, uh, Dutch companies winning uh, uh, contracts at ADB. And uh, I only have the results of 2020, but maybe good to mention just to give an idea in uh, the Dutch companies uh, won tenders of a total amount of 22 million. So there's quite some presence of Dutch companies having a track record with ADB finance projects. Uh, and even uh, 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 providing services and products indirectly through uh, foreign companies that won contracts at ADB. So really as subcontractors, it was even 126 million. So there is quite some interest. There's also quite some activities. So uh, also with today, uh, uh, it's very pleased to see in the chat there are so many questions on the techniques uh, and we hope we can uh, keep the discussion running. So um, that said, before we close this brown bag, we would like to, gi uh, to give a bit of attention to a potential follow up or anything uh, that has not been mentioned before, uh, as this was probably quite some information to digest today. Uh, we, would have, we would be happy to know uh, what parts of the presentation sparked uh, your interest. Uh, and if you wish to know more uh, or, or any uh, further discussions, uh, what would it be? So uh, indeed, in the chat, you already see the first question uh, my, Leila, uh, my colleague Leila uh, just uh, put in the chat, but I will also share my screen. So the first question, uh, would be uh, which part of the presentation did you find most interesting? So any specific companies, certain angles? Uh, I'm just see. typing it now. <laughs> yep. Of course, it's also uh, 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 just a short mentioning on the innovation or technique. It doesn't have to be extensive, but just to give an idea what you find interesting uh, or something you want to mention uh, about the brown bag of today is uh, uh, very helpful for us to know. 
so we will wait just a few seconds. See quite some things coming up, so that is great. Landfills indeed, proteins. Jules, right. these comments sort yeah. of these comments uh, sort so of uh, view, uh, mirror what my first response to your presentation was. The way you presented across the value chain was fantastic. Thank you for that. Great. Yeah. Well, many thanks in any case to to Hans Reukelman that mobilized all the companies uh, 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 in the presentation. Um, yeah. So uh, I would like to go before we close down to the next question. Uh, for us to give an understanding in which countries uh, you would have projects. Uh, maybe that gives uh, an understanding for us, uh, yeah, which context we were thinking of, because as the uh, uh, companies also were mentioned, they already have a track record in specific countries, so then we know, uh, yeah, which countries uh, uh, we're talking about. Uh, Steve, may I uh, chip in? Uh, I would like to ask the questions. Please, Terry, jump in. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Terry. Is uh, the ADB uh, waste management specialist. So uh, uh, we have received actually many requests from our uh, different countries members, and then many of them, as pointed out by uh, some of my colleagues, are not the big city but the secondary cities. So, for example, in India, in Pakistan, and they are all looking for so-called regional cooperation. They cite some example from China, but I think from the uh, Dutch perspective, because you are working, uh, you you have the genes in a, of the collaboration. So the regional cooperation model in Dutch uh, will be highly interested, uh, even though the different status is different, but the collaboration uh, uh, is the same because. I think the issue in some of the countries, they don't have the reprocessing capacity in locally. They need to work together with others uh, in order to really, when they recycle the material, they can reprocess it into uh, the products and make it really uh, circular, circular uh, rather than just ship it out to somewhere else. And, but it will, be different, it will be difficult for them to do so. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much for that last uh, uh, question. I think the, we will get back to, uh, on that because there will be definitely some uh, angles uh, on which we can look at. Um, just before we close off, I would like to do the last question. Uh, I think it's uh, already mentioned a few uh, times before. So if you are interested to keep the discussion going, if you have certain uh, uh, discussions you want to have, what type of follow-up do you think could be relevant after today's brown bag? Uh, you don't have to be there. It can be a very concept or just throw some ideas, uh, but uh, it's great to know uh, what the appetite is for a follow-up uh, and we can get back to you. So uh, you can use the chat now and just uh, put up your ideas. And as everyone is mentioning uh, uh, some ideas, so you can just continue with doing so. Uh, uh, simultaneously, I would like to to thank everyone uh, today for be for the active uh, uh, participation. When in the chat, indeed, there was it was quite busy, so that's great. Also, thank you, uh, thanks to all the Dutch companies uh, for joining this initiative and being able to be present today. Uh, and thanks to all the ADB staff for joining and uh, listening and uh, and Steve to you as well uh, for making this event happen. So thank you. Thanks Jules and thanks AED for fronting up and starting this. It's much appreciated. Um, 